this is a new series I've been working on and it is something of mine which I've wanted to do for quite some time and it's something that hasn't been talked about really that I can think of in uh, much detail on the historical uh, YouTube or in uh, any other field and that is the Christianization of the Anglo-Saxons. This will be several part series so the first one in chronological order that I'm going to be covering is the conversion of Ethelbert, King of the Kent. We will also be covering the Georgian missionaries and the role of Ethelbert's wife, Bertha, who was the daughter of the Frankish king, Chalbert I. During the final centuries of the Western Roman Empire, the Western Romans began to rely heavily on barbarians to occupy the frontier borders but also to occupy positions within legions and even within roles within political life. Slowly but surely these barbarians would sometimes rebel or other times demand greater land and greater roles and titles. Spain went to the Visigoths along with Aquitaine and what's now much southern France. Gothic tribes also started to occupy that of the uh, Roman province of Dalmatia and the Vandals, Tunisia North and Roman North Africa. The Franks, who were one of Rome's closest allies in the barbarian world, were given and sometimes rewarded with greater land. During this demise, within the Roman Empire, Britain would also suffer. In 383, the usurper Magnus Maximus withdrew troops from northern and western Britain, leaving effectively the entire province uh, and Ireland completely defenceless. Thirty odd years later, the Romano-British expelled magistrates of the usurper, which then began a clear distinction that Britain was finally came to the end of Roman rule. The final nail in the coffin was in the year 476, where Odica, a Germanic, possibly Gothic, warlord, seized control of the province of Italia, Sicilia and Dalmatia from the boy emperor Romulus Augustus. Now, not much is known of how Romano-Britain transitioned into the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. The historic theory is that during the period lack of Roman control, population of Romano-Britain lacked the means and the resources and the legal rights to defend themselves, bearing in mind the legions were drawn in, as we said, in 386. This meant they would look, need to look for other individuals, external forces, possibly even mercenaries, to deal with barbarian raids from that from Ireland and the other Celtic nations. According to Bede, this fell upon Saxons, who would go and protect the Romano-British in exchange for payment. But what we know by 588, England... Anglo-Saxon England was ruled by a, several kings and several kingdoms uh, and that they all followed, according to Bede, a form of Germanic paganism similar to that of Norse mythology. Though Bede does point out there would be few subtle differences uh, in spelling and customs, but naturally uh, it would be similar to that of the Saxons uh, that Charlemagne would have faced uh, a few centuries later. Now, Kent, in, which is the topic of this video, was settled by, uh, we are told, by the Jutes, who came from uh, what's now modern-day Denmark. They settled in southeast England, uh, which was become known to, uh, as the Kingdom of Kent. Now, it included territories such as Kent itself, but also uh, beyond parts of Sussex and um, and surrounding uh, probably what's now uh, su um, areas of Essex as well, because the boundary of the borders changed quite frequently during Anglo-Saxon periods between uh, various wars and rivalries. 
During this time, Christianity started to bounce back on the continent. The heresy of the Aryan Christians began to fall by the wayside. Catholicism in the world, or the early forms of Catholicism of the Latin Church started to gain prominence among not just among uh, in Italy but also among the more dominant Western power that was emerging from the Dark Age period, that of the Franks, and in this tale of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons we are covering, the Franks played quite a crucial role in this. In 588, Ethelbert, king of the Kent and a pagan king, marries Bertha, a princess, uh, Frankish princess and daughter to Charibert I, one of the Moravian kings of the Franks. Like most marriages of that time, it carried with it some conditions, including that bish- a bishop named Ludhard was to accompany Bertha to Kent uh, and be able to conversions to the native population there. Upon doing some research, I noticed that one interesting factor was that there was no direct attempt in the marriage arrangement to convert Ethelbert directly as this would become normal in future conversions uh, especially the Grand Duchy of Lithuania which became the last European nation to convert to Christianity. Luthard would become a major influence in the formation of Canterbury along with Saint Augustine of Canterbury, who would be the first archbishop to oversee the conversion of the people within Kent, but also within the neighbouring Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Nine years after the marriage, Gregory I, Pope, that is, organised a mission, a Gregorian mission, to Anglo-Saxon England. At the head of this would be, as I've mentioned before, the first Archbishop, Augustine of Canterbury. His job was simple, to arrive in Kent to and to convert the population of Anglo-Saxon England to Christianity. The entourage landed in the spring of 597 on the Isle of Thanet off the southeast coast of England, and it was well received by King Ethelbert of Kent, who gave the missionaries dwellings in places of Canterbury in the old St. Martin's Church, where he allowed them to preach to the locals. Ethelbert, even though a pagan king, actively supported the Christianization methods, Though, there, again, as I said, there is no actual indication of his own conversion at this moment in time, until some time later. In Kent, the monks within the mission found great success, and according to Bede, they were able to go from town to town, and ha- baptising as they went. Naturally, this grand success that the mission had ultimately led to that of the king following suit and officially converting to the faith of that of his wife. In the following autumn, Augustine, who was very much at the centre of the success, was consecrated bishop of the English by Saint Virgilus of Ares. This meant the first diocese within Anglo-Saxon England had been created and that the conversion efforts for the Anglo-Saxons was now an unstoppable force. Given the political structure of that of Kent and the similarities between that of a clan and the clan chief, when word got out the king had converted to Christianity, it is said that according to be thousands of Ethelbert subjects were baptised by Augustine on Christmas Day in 597. 
Augustine sent two monks to Rome to inform the papacy of their unprecedented and in some ways unexpected success. The two monks returned in 601 with the pallium, uh, a symbol of metropolitan tradition from Gregor, uh, Pope Gregor, Gregory for Augustine, along with more missionaries um, to convert the neighbouring kingdoms. Due to the vast numbers of conversions in the kingdom of Kent, it became clear uh, that Augustine needed greater land and also greater properties to preach from. This resulted in many pagan temples within the kingdom of Kent and pagan sites effectively being converted into Christian places of worship. The role of bishops to consecrate these places and the thus giving authority further meant that the kingdom of Kent effectively became a Christian kingdom like that of its neighbours on, con on the continent. At the centre of this was Canterbury. Augustine founded Christ Church along with monastery of St Peter and Paul which would later go on to rank as the second Benedictian house in all of Europe. In 616, Ethelbert died and his son, Edbald, became the next king. Though, unlike his father and his stepmother, Bertha, Edbald was in fact a pagan.